Hey everyone, really excited hey. to be here and uh, really excited for our second AMA expert live stream. And I'm joined by Shahar and Chess from Ground Cover. We're going to talk about EBPF, we're going to talk about observability, we're going to answer your questions live. So, oh, wow, we have folks from all over the world joining. That's nice. It's good to, good to see. And by the way, this is being recorded as well. So, a little bit in you know, like informal session just ask ask you can ask us anything about around the topics and uh, we you know we'll be answering your questions but before we get started uh, thanks a lot for joining folks shahar and uh, chess um, looking forward to uh, you know speaking with you and uh, having a good conversation uh, you all might already know shahar we did a podcast together and uh, chess you're new to the channel you see james has joined hi james how's it going we are building up to 100 plus viewers now, so that's good to see. But before we get started, uh, let's do a little bit of a quick intro. So, Shahar, would you like to give yourself a quick intro and then Shez? Yeah, sure. sure. Uh, first, happy to be here. Thanks for having us, Kunal. Uh, I'm Shahar. I'm the co-founder and CEO of Groundcover. Um, before Groundcover, uh, I've been a lot of years in engineering from very different aspects, about a decade in cybersecurity then about seven or eight years in applied machine learning, most recently at Apple before ground cover. So uh, definitely, you know, ground cover was born from experience and from a lot of years of being on the user side. So kind of that's, that's my journey. Hi, I'm Chez. I'm uh, the CTO and uh, co-founder of ground cover. Uh, before ground cover, I've been uh, almost 10 years in uh, building um, yeah, Linux devices and uh, backend and scaling backend. Um, yeah, really excited to be here and talk about eBPF and APM. Cool, cool. All right. Uh, let's get started. And really nice to have you all here. Uh, by the way, this is the first time I'm also streaming on LinkedIn. So we have a few folks joining from uh, LinkedIn as well. So it's being streamed on LinkedIn and YouTube. It's going to stay there, so you can watch it uh, again later on. But uh, before, let's you know, just get started. Let's set some agenda. So we're talking about, you know, how can eBPF be used in observability, and we'll talk about the rising costs of application performance management and monitoring and observability and all sorts of things around that. So uh, can you tell us a little bit about, like, an overview, basically, what this session is about and whom is it targeted towards and some of the key takeaways that we'll have, and then we can dive into the agenda yeah uh definitely i mean basically ground cover is uh is a company in, is trying to reinvent uh, kubernetes apm we're trying to say there's a few major pain points currently uh in the market around application performance monitoring what we know is that developers don't need to be educated about you know the value of application monitoring it's very clear how, how what is the data you need to debug Everybody wants to have their logs, metric, traces, you know, working at scale and and there when they need it for any trouble. Uh, but we, what we do feel is that eventually this value is not being adopted properly by developers, by DevOps teams, by SRE teams. And we feel that the reasons are 
uh, one on the effort side of working so hard to instrument your code, maintain that instrumentation over time, and you know eventually get that APM value running in production on multiple environments and you know multiple teams that have to take care of it. And the other side is cost and scalability of eventually, you know, doing that all in a microservices-based environment in Kubernetes at huge scales and you know, make it that uh, be uh, cost effective and, and also predictable. So we feel that teams are very uh, worried about cost. So we're going to talk about how eBPF, which is a very interesting technology that, that allows for a completely different onboarding experience into observability. Suddenly the onboarding and the organizational pain of maintaining observability is completely different. How that combines with a cloud native approach to how you should aggregate and monitor the data. Uh, can be a really cost-effective, yet re really high, fast, time-to-value solution for observability. Amazing. Looking forward to it. And um, we already have, we're getting some questions around uh, like ground cover as well. So we'll cover those later. But do uh, you want to quickly answer that one? <laughs> That's a good one. Um, does ground cover still like support <laughs> Windows? Um, yeah, I think it built and go. So yeah, definitely. There you go. All right. And by the way, uh, I'll leave all the links in the description below. So there's already, I think you can find a pinned tweet somewhere here uh, that would share with you, you know, like ground cover, how to get started. I will obviously talk about that as well. Um, let's you know, dive into the uh, discussion here. You we were mentioning about rising costs of APM, right? Um, can you tell us a little bit more about like the current pain points around uh, application uh, level observability yeah i think i think there are two two pains one is uh is the cost driven and one is more instrumentation um you know to instrument every service could be a very hard task uh usually even if uh um if, we, if we're talking about um, grown up mature companies you have come some kind of legacy code you have third party uh, devices that you or you know, instances that you're not even really control of and sometimes it's really really hard to uh, coordinate all this instrumentation. So that's like from practical uh, aspect. But even then, like sending all this data, all these traces and and, uh, and logs to some kind of a, a SaaS provider and then aggregate that, it it has dramatic, dramatic um, impact of cost. Even if even if we just look at egress so, and, and definitely if we if we look at store every single event, even though 99% of them are usually meaningless we don't need repeated events uh to just to store them and never query them so usually what we see is that the company started working with microservices which automatically increased the volume of interaction between services and and that cost a lot to store thanks for sharing shares uh shaha do you have anything to add on to it Sorry, I'm doing a lot of multitasking. I'm going through all the comments as well, comments and filtering out the nice ones as well. Yeah, I think that uh, you know, if we just go to the bottom line of uh, you know, even not explaining all the all the journey that got us here, eventually the pricing models currently of uh, you know deep observability solutions like full blown APMs, uh, I think they're just uh, becoming um, such a hurdle that they're basically um, uh, kind of disable the ability of teams to get that value. We see most teams are either using a vendor-based solution like Datadog, New Relic, and other solutions and not activating the APM tier or just choosing to go for a non-vendor-based solution and kind of comprise their own open source stack from uh, you know things that they can get and, and scale with the cost that they can predict. So I think it's gotten to the point where it's so costly, it's so unpredictable, it's so hard to maintain that uh, uh, on the cost side, it's definitely uh, even preventing team from getting the value. And I think that a decade or more later, uh, past you know, the point where traces and kind of the triples of observability were, were invented, to get into this point, I think it's even a failure for us as a community, as, 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 a, as a community that tries to drive the value to, you know, to the actual uh, um, you know, workspaces of the developers. I think we kind of failed in that. And I think we even see that in adoption of uh, the solutions we have today. And, uh, everyone is trying to figure out better ways to scale things. We have a lot of uh, solutions in the market that try to fill that gap. Uh, that, that all they do is try to create cost reduction uh, based solutions and offerings on you know the data that you collect and the way you store it. 
Uh, and that's we definitely need to reinvent everything. We need to reinvent stuff in a proper way, bottom up, and kind of build the observability solutions that can hold you know hold the ground in the in the cloud native domain where you know microservices are growing and becoming more fragmented and API driven communication is getting at crazy volumes. Something has to change in kind of the way we 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 treat it, and that that's where we are today. Yeah, and so speaking of some of the challenges, you know. Uh, when you talk about observability, then we some of the challenges you run into is like so obviously like let's say cost, for example, right? Scalability, um, sec security. So my my question is that even though there are like so many challenges, what is like the current scenario of like how are people dealing with it? Um, like right now, in in what ways? Or do you think there's like a little bit of a like they are not really dealing with it the right way. I think um, you can see it. Uh, I think Loki database, for instance, is a, it's a it's a good uh, it's a good um, progress into uh, direction of handling this massive volume of data because we realized, I think, as, as a community, we realized most logs we we never query, uh, so we we don't want to pay the price of uh, indexing all the the data as a as a text search engine. Uh, because we're gonna never gonna query it so enough with this 100 nodes clusters of elastic search um, but it's it's not enough uh, we have to to walk towards um, um, aggregate and digest raw data into metrics and into meaningful insights and events um, at the node level itself because even shipping the data is really it's getting really really expensive so uh, i think i think we we have to to find a way to aggregate digest uh, create metrics, which is much more economic um, way handling things and, uh, and and storing them. And, and we see some uh, very really good progress in time time series databases that we uh, we see the the world going there. As uh, you can see at Victoria Metrics, which I think is is a brilliant technology, and and you also can see Mimir that that that's also a good uh, direction. Uh, so I think metrics and 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 node level digest of data is is the right way to go. Um, you just to, to add on that, I, I totally agree with uh, Chaz. I just uh, think that uh, uh, one thing more to mention is the way that teams are handling it today is that they actually place themselves inside this trade-off of you know budget and observability depth, and they handle it themselves by you know controlling the sampling rate of traces and you know picking wild numbers that no one knows what it means. Uh, half half percent of traces, uh, one percent of the traces, no one really knows. How well, how well of a coverage they will get eventually, but they do that, you know, so that their uh, manager won't be mad at the end of the day or the end, or the end of the month on you know the bill that they get. And they do the same for metric cardinality. You know, you work so hard, you instrument the metric, you get the job done. It's, it it gets into you know the vendor side, you get the bill, and then you cut it off at the end of the month because you can't pay it next month. And I think that that's the way teams are are getting by today. I mean, it's not like uh, the solutions aren't working. We see teams covering less than what they want, not running solutions on their dev or staging environment, but targeting specific production environment, you know, targeting the microservice that is the hub that they want to track failures for and kind of drop in other microservices. We saw all, I mean, Chess can expand on that. We saw all the different kind of combinations of that with our customers. And I think that's a really uh, painful place to be that as an engineer, you shouldn't be in. Uh, and hopefully that's that's what we can solve because we don't want anyone to be in that position of you know trying to figure out what he, what the budget can can do for him and you know pick and choose what he observe. Yeah, yeah. L let me ask one more question around like that before I forget. Uh, by the way, we're getting so many chat. Like m most folks are asking about EBPF, so we'll get there. Don't worry. Uh, some are asking about uh, you know, common challenges, uh, ABM or whatever. But um, about about this. If you talk about the observability reality in the today's market, um, and you mentioned microservices, so obviously things are getting a little complex. For example, I know I was talking to you in the podcast we did, and shares like the 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 thing I'm trying to say is that I I go to all these events and I'm like, if we take an example for Kubernetes, right? So we all know Kubernetes is a very popular topic. Um, everyone's talking about it, so many conferences happening, events and startups. But then I talk to companies, some local small startups or other, other people, and I'm like, are you using it? And they're like, no, because it's complex. 
So how, you know, how do we get started? And we, we are not trained enough or whatever. So let's have a talk about the current scenario, or like the the observability market today. So do you think there's like a little trade-off between simplicity and cost? So if you like you know, reduce costs, would that be like vice versa to simplicity or uh, can we have both? That's a that's a very good question, I think. And I, and I think about this a lot as, a, as an engineer and, and, and an architect, because uh, obviously there's trade off. Um, but but there's another aspect of that, like uh, which which is development velocity, uh, which microservices are are um, yeah, enabling uh, in a way because you can separate different groups with different responsibility, with different products and, and coordinate by APIs. Uh, which basically that's microservices and, and it's, it, it's, it looks like it's a new thing, but it's really old. Um, uh, I think we, we, we were talking about that, like from the, from the eighties, uh, we just, I think what happened is like with every cool concept and technology, we took it really far and, and, and we, and we're seeing startups and, and small companies dealing with hundreds of microservices, hundreds. And, and in that stage, it's getting out of hand and it's getting too expensive. And, and it actually um, decreases the development velocity because no one really knows everything about the production, how it works. Um, so I think it's, it's all about balance. Um, I think we will be surprised um, to hear about huge vendors that are actually built on monolith. Um, uh, but, but I'm sure it exists. And uh, I think... We just need to find the right balance, which uh, it's according to the state of the company and, and the challenges and the organizational aspect of that. Um, obviously, observability costs are just increased even exponentially by microservices because we now need to track about all these graphs and, and all these APIs. Everyone is talking to everyone and, 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 and in old and you know, legacy um, solutions you pay by you know volume uh, even though you don't really need all this data so um yeah uh, we need to first of all a little bit uh, return to basics uh, but also um, we need to find better ways how can we observe and monitor this kind of architecture architecture because they're here to stay in my opinion i don't think i don't see us going back to monolith um, i just think it's uh, we need to fine tune it a little bit yeah, there's a question on the uh, around that. So, how can you effectively monitor the performance of? It's a big, big question. Uh, <laughs> yeah, mm, yeah, yeah. So um, that's that's a good that's you know that's that's the question. Yeah. Of, the uh, <laughs> yeah. Um, so I think uh, personally, I think metrics. I I'm obsessed with metrics. Um, I think. Uh, first of all, start with uh, SLA. Like, what is our services? Uh, what are the SLAs for our services? Uh, what? Is, where is the bottlenecks? So um, the golden signals, you know, Google uh, um, uh, uh, written, uh, which is uh, basically you can narrow down it to three uh, signals. It's a throughput, uh, error rate, and latency. Um, I think that's a very good place to start um, because at least you can you can tell what is going on by look at numbers. And I think engineers really love numbers. Um, so then you can correlate it with traces, uh, which is actually what happened. So um, metrics will help you understand what is going on. Traces will help you uh, reproduce it. Uh, and, and logs, because you know people uh, tend to explain their code in text still. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm joking. I think Logs uh, has a, a really special place and, and we see still a lot of developers use it. Um, I think maybe it's a good start. To, it's a good po point to talk about eBPF and, and, and why it helps uh, solving that. Uh, so just to, in, a, in a short, eBPF is a, is a way to extend the Linux kernel in a very um, uh, fast and safe way. Uh, so uh, we used to uh, we used uh, to have kernel models, uh, which was really hard to maintain and really hard to uh, build, and and it was really slow. So because the the impact of kernel models are you know, could be dramatic and and drastic on 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 the on the host itself. So eBPF is giving us a way to extend the kernel and actually uh, insert um, trace points and capture data. 
So what it means, it means we can um, deploy uh, an eBPF agent and automatically instrument the, the kernel and get all the APIs and events that we care about. So that is a, a key factor to reduce the time developers need to invest in instrumentation and thinking about all the third parties and how do we monitor them? Because eBPF basically sees everything that goes into uh, our services and, and from. So uh, I hope it answered uh, what is eBPF and, <laughs> and how, do we, uh, how can we leverage it to observability and security, obviously, because at the end of the day, observability and security, is, it's all about the same thing. It's, it's data that we, we need to capture and we need to digest and process. And what about scalability? Yeah, as you scale, uh, how, how, how do you? What are some of the things you take into consideration um, in terms of observability when you're scaling? Yes, another very good question. Um, so I think the, the pain point today for uh, time series databases is uh, is cardinality. So when you scale, if you need the data and you need to understand it in a, and digest it in a very granular and cardinal, uh, high cardinality way, it's, it's going to be a problem because if you have a, a 200 nodes running a thousand spots, um, it, it, it's going to be really expensive. Um, old databases, as, uh, for instance, uh, Prometheus, which you know kind of invented time series, uh, could not really handle uh, the load of uh, modern architecture. So um, uh, Victoria Metrics, as we said before, Victoria Metrics and, and Mimir is, is going there. Um, even uh, Timescale uh, had his, uh, its, uh, its take on it. But I think what we can do and take control of is how granular do we ne really need the information. If we're going to add uh, uh, a lot of labels, it's going to be very expensive. We, we could be, you know, we could want it, but we just need to think about it. And what we see when we come to uh, to engineers uh, and, and we see startups and, and, and big companies, we see that a lot of the metrics are really, at the end of the day, are not being used. So we're just you know, paying the price for storing them. So that, that's a very good, uh, good starting point when, when you try to reduce your costs. I'm getting some shout outs for ground cover, so as you can see on the screen, it's nice. Um, all right, let's do one thing. Let's answer some of the questions because you're getting quite a lot and it's all piling up. So there's one around, uh, one more for ground cover, which is why should I choose ground cover for uh, our workload uh, when we compare it to something, let's say, Cube Shark? Yeah, so I think Cube Shark is it's more like, uh, you know, Wireshark for, uh, for Kubernetes. Which is it's it's nice it's 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 a nice ad hoc, um, but if when when you really try to correlate signals from for instance uh, traces and logs, so when you see a 500 request, you want to see the logs previous uh, and after, and, and you want to see correlated by CPU and, and 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 memory metrics on top of it, and you want to see Kubernetes events on top of it. I think Cube Shark is it's it's really all about like traffic. And, and, and I think context is everything in these kind of cases. Uh, you see an HTTP request that it failed. Nice. What happened? What else happened? Um, any suspicious logs? Um, high CPU? Maybe uh, prob readiness failed? So I think uh, it's not enough to have traces. And, and you see a lot of companies uh, um, travel and, and struggling with uh, correlate all these kind of signals. And, and I think this is what we build ground cover on top. Uh, correlate every signal, uh, digest huge amount of traffic, and uh, create uh, the needles, the needle from the needles. I think that's the basic definition in, in a sense of an APM. I mean, that's why that's what an APM should do for you. And the, and the same same follow up question. I think the same answer applies to that. So maybe for this question, you can tell us a little bit more about ground cover. Yeah, I mean, ground cover is basically trying to say. Um, we can use eBPF in a way that uh, is still very early for the community to um, to do otherwise. I mean, we're definitely very advanced in our eBPF capability just because it's still very raw technology. We're saying there's a way uh, to take it all the way through to being a, a sensor that can be really utilized for APM grade value, which means you can get the same grade of value you would expect from deep instrumentation and just use an eBPF agent to get all that. 
and that's you know on us to prove and everybody who tries out the product could uh, kind of get it get an impression for of how deep EPF can get and how much data it can cover and once you do that the other part of our mission is is the ability to as Chess said take all this data and be Kubernetes native about it collect Kubernetes events that are you know otherwise lost in context if uh, if not connected properly to the container logs and everything else that is you know an application level information and provide as much data granularity as we can around traces metrics and all the events that we collect so you can troubleshoot faster basically so the experience is a full apm you know you build your dashboard your alerting pipeline you get all the logs metrics and traces in one place but you get all that out of the box using eupf and you know the kubernetes apis that we harness without configuring anything you know changing the deployment uh, changing your runtime anything like that and uh, that's part of the of the wow effect that uh, you can do all that the result is also that this APM is much higher coverage than what you expect. Because if you don't have to work hard, it means that you can cover whatever you, you want. And it, it can be also things as Chess mentioned, mentioned before, which are not your code. You know, that Nginx that is running in your cluster or that Istio control plane you're, you're currently, you know, using as a service mesh. And I think that's another very important leap uh, in, in the fact that once things get simple, once they get, uh, you know, once you go all the way down to the kernel level, once you see all the data that is flowing through production, suddenly the coverage also gets much better. And that's what we're trying to do to, you know, actually create a full APM value from EVPF. Uh, it's a super interesting technology. There's a lot of ad hoc, ad hoc tools that people can use today. Uh, but a full APM experience is something that, that is still, um, you know, rare to get. And that's what we're trying to do. Cool, cool. And um, if you want to learn more about it, you can, you can check out the link in the description. Uh, there's, uh, there's a question by Varsh. Is it going to happen that every single sidecar container will run at, uh, run at the kernel level? Mm -hmm. um, so I think it depends on uh, what type of sidecar. Uh, if we're talking about service, me service meshes, um, I don't know. But uh, I think it's, it's a good possibility. Uh, I think we projects like Cilium are uh, trying to take the the network overhead and and uh, put it in uh, in the kernel uh, handling, which is a it's a very good idea. But obviously, there is always the the same trade off of adding new capabilities are harder to uh, uh, to implement in eBPF. So, as of everything, we need to think if this type of sidecar is really simple, should it be really scalable? Uh, uh, and I think, yeah, probably big clusters will transition from sidecars to eBPF and kernel models. But um, I'm not sure that every sidecar, not yet. Cool. cool. All right. Uh, let's move forward. Oh, I was getting so many questions. This is why we do it live. That's a little bit, you know, like good questions. You can get your answer. And... More fun. All right. More fun, more interactive. I love I love live <laughs> sessions a lot. <laughs> All right. Uh, so the next one is around. Okay. Um, curious to understand why EBPF is here and why it is a reality to stay. Uh, what better unique? It's solving. Uh, I think we already answered this. Maybe let's do it. Can you explain it in like layman terms? Maybe I think that will help quite a lot to other people. So I think. Um... Like uh, it's it's I think it's the same process with with hardware, you know. Uh, hardware has, uh, got really hard to to innovate. Uh, it takes a lot of time. Uh, I think it's Thomas' uh, uh, example uh, in the last KubeCon. So uh, we invented uh, you know embedded software that uh, we can uh, and, and Linux operating system that we can uh, uh, upgrade faster. And then the kernel itself got pretty heavy and pretty, uh, you know, scary to change. So we re reduced the innovation time from, I don't know, 10 years of uh, hardware to maybe three years of, of uh, kernel. But with eBPF, we're talking about weeks. Uh, and, and, and that, you know, enables us to, to innovate in this kind of domain really, really fast. And I, honestly, I think maybe I don't want to get into that, but maybe Wasm and JavaScript of the other 
the equivalent of of the of the of other domains of the, the how big this change is i, I hope yeah. it's, uh, it's simple uh, Perhaps we just um, we can also say that um, if a lot of folks don't uh, know what's happening right now in the market, but I think EBPF has already proven that it's here to stay. I mean, we're definitely seeing it uh, being heavily adopted by cloud providers. Uh, it's already part the deep part of the architecture, uh, and we're also seeing it, um, you know, in massive uses in uh, security as kind of the next generation agent for security. So it's definitely uh, showing all the signs that it's here to stay and already proven uh, for a lot of verticals. And I think observability is clearly next. And we also see you know, the, the big vendors that ground cover is definitely competing with going into, in this direction. So I think uh, it's a very promising technology and uh, we're kind of past the point of POC in a sense. It's definitely here, it's definitely working. Uh, it's providing crazy value and uh, we should focus on how we can use it uh, in our day-to-day -day, uh, work. Cool, cool. And uh, let's talk a bit more about the observability side of things. So what is basically like, what's the promise of EBPF for observability? Maybe you can share about its impact and a lot of questions around that is when, when you can see on the screen is basically like the same question. Yeah, Yeah, sure. So EBPF basically gives you um, the superpower to instrument all your applications in really three minutes. Um, the, the alternative is, uh, probably endless job uh, or like every time you uh, put a new service or or adding a new third party to some kind of ingress or using new technology, you need to instrument it. So eBPF automatically eliminate all this need of instrumentation and just give you all the data that you can actually dream of. So um, I think it's a dramatic improvement. Thanks for sharing. Uh, Shes, uh, Shahar, do you have something to add? Um, yeah, just, just think that um, basically EVPF is the, the ability, as Chess says, to just monitor code without being part of the application. So I think that uh, beside looking at the technical part, which is super, super important, I think, uh, as Chess said, you know, it moves stuff from being instrumented in weeks into being instrumented in three minutes. I think that also the organizational aspect of it is super important. And I think uh, it's something that we experience in our day to day is that if you try to get to explore the value of an APM solution in a real organization, beside all the hard work, it takes so much coordination. And I think we got in, into a point that it actually um, separates the people that want to get the observability value, like our SREs and our product engineering uh, from getting the value because they have to go through a long funnel of, of convincing the R&D in a sense to work for them, instrument uh, the, the value into the code. And then, you know, this funnel eventually propagates to them and hopefully it's uniform across the organization. Uh, and EVPF allows, allows us to change that, uh, you know, value funnel in a sense that they can suddenly control the inputs that they use to monitor production. And I think that's that, that, that shortened the cycle of an organization from you know setting the KPIs they want to do to monitor production and getting them, uh, which is uh, I think it's it's a it's a dramatic change uh, in the in the way organizations view observability, kind of moving developers aside for a second from you know the 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 process of getting observability uh, in in place, uh, and and that's that's maybe a major factor even more than. The technology aspect in some organizations. I mean, even if you could instrument, sometimes it's you know the process takes months of you know organizing and coordinating and all that. Cool. Thanks for sharing. Uh, Shes, you got a shout out. All right. Are the EBPF scripts kernel agnostic? Um, that's a deep dive into EBPF. Um, <laughs> I changing say, topic now. <laughs> <laughs> I wouldn't say uh, entirely agnostics, but uh, EBPF brings some concepts of uh, core RE and uh, um, the ability to dynamically um, kernel kernel programs. Um, so in a way, yeah, but we need to be very careful when you write an EBPF program because the different helpers of EBPF are they're dependent on different versions of the kernel. So each each kernel version adds another 
uh, function helpers. So you need to know what is the what is the lowest kernel version that you support. But the good way the good um, way here is uh, is that the kernel can actually detect that you cannot run it and just you know, say uh, this program is is not compatible. So the short answer is we try to make it kernel agnostics, but we're still working towards it to be completely agnostic. Well, we've got answers to the question and uh, another interesting one, which is why we get to hear that EVPF will dominate service mesh. Um, I think EVPF simpl simplify um, the, um, the network orchestration um, inside the kernel. So that allow um, a, a very, a very controllable environment of managing and, and routing and handling all this stuff because it's it's centralized into the kernel uh, and it's very dynamic. So it allow us to do cool stuff and and still keep it in a very performant way. If we're gonna do it user space, we're gonna be limited uh, in the performance that we that we actually uh, want to achieve. So uh, if we want to achieve a high throughput. We, we really must go into EPPF or kernel, uh, other kernel functionalities that uh, are also getting advanced. So in my opinion is yes, I think EBPF will be much more adopted in the, in the close time, but we need to remember that for not every company really should worry about high throughput of network. It's really, sh it's like microservices as we talked before, we, we don't want to use it too soon. We need to, to keep in mind that most users can do fine with a classic network that they have. Cool. cool. Uh, do you answer? Do you want to answer the next one? Uh, I'm not sure I, I, I'm capable of. <laughs> it's out of topic. All right. <laughs> um, I can Google it. There's <laughs> <laughs> another good one. A lot of EPPF funds. Let's stick to those. Um, EPPF scripts are not completely kernel eligible. Okay, this is a that's a, a good answer. Thought for that's the good answer. answer. <laughs> <laughs> um, all right. So this is a good one. How does EPPF compare to traditional monitoring approaches such as log parsing, metriscaping? Yeah. So um, EPPF is not really um, you know competing with log parsing or metric scraping. EBPF is uh, is more um, into the domain of uh, tracing. So instead of adding uh, code to export your APIs uh, to another uh, another sync or another vendor or whatever, uh, we just we just you know the data is going through the kernel anyway. So we don't need to duplicate it and send it another to another destination. We can just capture it from there and save it and uh, or digest process convert to metrics and then send what we think is important uh, according to the organizational slas so um ebpf basically gives you more more than just log metrics it gives you the the raw data and sometimes it could be really overwhelmed you can get basically every event or any event that you really want um yeah so it's not competing with monitoring logs and metrics Google. Yeah, Meta uses it. I mean, most of the big companies uh, use it. So I think that yeah. should answer the question around the credibility of EVPF. If the big tech is... Yeah, Google, Facebook, Meta, um, uh, Netflix, uh, Microsoft, uh, CrowdStrike, everyone's using uh, EVPF right now. And I think... Um, I think it's uh, it's harder to make mistakes when you're controlled by a strict environment as eBPF. So yeah, I'm sure there will always be vulnerabilities in new kernel features, uh, but it's it's safer to have uh, sandbox and and virtual machines that you know run your code uh, instead of just deploying uh, possibly a vulnerable user space without any sandbox or limitations. So uh, I think, yeah, EBPF is definitely uh, the way to go these days. 
I think just just to add here that uh, I mean talking about the EBPF development and kind of using that that, that uh, it's super interesting. But I think that our, since it's such a new technology, um, uh, it's kind of our expectations that developers should know how to use it. And I think that that's that's not necessarily the case. I mean, it's definitely it definitely should get into the point of maturity that uh, people just enjoy EBPF in a sense, not knowing that it's running under the hood. Uh, and not every developer has to know how to, you know, operate and understand all the value. And I mean, companies like Meta have tons of ad hoc tools that, you know, they know how to build and maintain and, and use in production. And I think what we're trying to do in ground cover, and, and I think that's where EPF is going, is, is trying to create high level value. I mean, in a sense, if if in a year from now we're not considered an EBPF company and our customers don't know that's EBPF, that's EBPF running underneath, I think we've we've succeeded uh, because um, we we don't think every developer using Kubernetes and and so on should know the depth of what's going on there. And I think uh, we should find a way to get the value from EBPF and you know let people work with it and enjoy it and not necessarily you know run run specific ad hoc EBPF programs. And that's the situation today, basically. So. I think going in, into EBPF today, it's, it's a hard task. There's not uh, you know, a lot of documentation, a lot of uh, end-to-end tools, and uh, companies like Meta can do that, but not everyone can do that. Thanks for sharing. Uh, so another one, which is what is the role of APIs in EBPF? Um, so I'm not sure if if I understand correctly, the if I understand correctly, but uh, maybe we we're talking about the EBPF helpers, which is the basically APIs that the the programs are using. So uh, as we said before, um, when we how how do we achieve uh, security of EBPF um, programs? So every interaction between the, the sandbox program into the kernel space uh, is 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 being. Um, controlled by an eBPF helper and the API, if you want, uh, which is um, a strict function that the, the kernel offers you as, as, a, as an eBPF program that gives you something. It could be reading uh, user space memory and uh, and, it called, and also could be uh, adding a, a, an object to, to a map. So this is the way uh, of that our programs are interact with the kernel in a very secure and safe way. Cool. This is another interesting one, which is, uh, can you have help with platform engineering? Yeah, I think definitely. Um, I think EBPF, and, and I invite everyone to, to go into uh, BCC um, uh, repositories of, of exciting tools and gadgets. Uh, obviously, Brandon Gregg is uh, one of the, the most famous uh, people around the world that using uh, and, and developing EBPF and has so much um, crazy tools from tracking TCP connections and, um, you know, uh, and creating histograms of, of disk uh, throughput. So I think every engineer and especially a platform engineer can uh, leverage eBPF to uh, add ad hoc or even constant uh, programs to their production and get the, the metrics that they, they want to, to monitor. Uh, as you said, I think Meta is using um, um, 20 or something uh, uh, programs uh, on every production cluster or on every production uh, node and and I think uh, it, it also they add an ad hoc uh, programs uh, on demand when they troubleshoot and, and investigate uh, so definitely it's it's the way to go for infra monitoring and and troubleshooting Awesome. Um, I'm happy to answer your questions. Thanks for the shout out. Um, just one question here. How can eBPF be used to perform runtime security monitoring in Kubernetes? Um, yeah, that's, that's a, I think that's a, another good question. Um, as we said, eBPF can help you get any information that you want from, from the, the kernel environment, which would basically cover every user space uh, event. So if we look at security at the, at the, at the basic uh, thing that we need, to, we need to have when we want to secure our application is getting the data of what is going on. So for instance, we can, we can hook every um, exec function and get who is executing this program, what is this program, and, and, and decide if this is suspicious, uh, who is accessing files and why. 
and, and what are they doing right after. So all these uh, security questions are, can be answered easily and in a very holistic way with using eBPF. That's why we're seeing giant companies going there. Um, and, and, and I think the next generations of, uh, you know, XDR, like cloud agents will be based on eBPF for sure. Whoever is going to stay with Kettle Models are just going to stay behind. Google, well, uh, looking forward to seeing that. Uh, <laughs> um, all right, one one more question. I, uh, you know, wouldn't let you leave without answering that one, obviously, uh, because you have uh, implemented EVPF. You know, we've talked about ground cover and everything. So, can you share a little bit more about it? So, how ground cover uses EVPF? Uh, you know. You know, you're building the next gen of APM. And similar questions asked around that as well. How would you go about implementing eBPF since it's it isn't a kernel module? How does it extend kernel functionality? So yeah, basically you can share about how you've done it. Uh, yeah, sure. So sure. So um, uh, yeah, it's we are extending the kernel with uh, our functionality, which is basically capturing a lot of events of API. So for instance, um, you can hide uh http requests going from your cluster when you when you're monitoring it with ebpf because you're gonna uh instrument um in the kernel all the paths uh, that actually transmit data and from there you can actually capture the data and give it much more uh, meaningful kubernetes context for so what is the container uh, the pod the workload the namespace um so what we did is we built an agent that can actually capture all these APIs without changing uh, basically any 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 line of code. So you can just deploy ground cover and you see all this data, which is which could be uh, over, overwhelming because all of a sudden you can actually understand and see what is going on in your cluster. So eBPF allow us to tap into these functions. So first of all, you do the research, you understand where is the write and read paths. You put a, a hook or instrument these functions. And from there, you can capture it, digest, and create meaningful and Kubernetes contextual data, if that makes sense. And some folks who have just joined are asking about the speakers. So we already did an intro. <laughs> it's being mm -hmm. recorded. You can watch it later. And you can find them on LinkedIn. Uh, LinkedIn is pretty easy to search. Search by a name. And it's also in the description below. So if you want to connect with the speakers, after the session, uh, feel free to do so. All right. Uh, thank you. Really appreciate it. Um, and that's it. We answered all the questions. Oh, one more. Applications of eBPF in AI. Oh, Shaha, <laughs> you should take this. Hmm, uh, interesting. I mean, basically, uh, eBPF is kind of the way to get the data. Um, and I think that uh, what happens uh, next is that you get too much data. So definitely, it's, it's a lot of what ground cover is doing. You know, we have a lot of algorithms running in the agent, trying to uh, sift through all this data and eventually find what we need and sample and kind of determine uh, events using correlations, as, as Chess says, to determine that something is interesting and now this data is relevant. I think that's that's maybe the the most uh, prominent challenge of AI in eBPF. It, it's it's uh, the fast set of eBPF can be too strong sometimes. So you you get suddenly visibility into everything that goes on in the control plane and, and you know, the data plane and everything that, that's actually flowing. And if you don't know what to do with that and how to use it properly, you might get overwhelmed or, you know, overpriced with whatever data you, you want to store. So, I mean, everyone using eBPF in security or observability will eventually uh, do some form of, uh, of AI, uh, no matter how we call it, to treat that. Google and someone answered, uh, an additional follow-up, something around workloads and stuff. So yeah, nice to people. People are engaging in the chat. All right, that was a lot of questions. So amazing. Well, thanks a lot for joining. And yeah, really appreciate, appreciate it. All right, cool, cool, cool. cool. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> yeah, just one last. Yeah, yeah, just sure. uh, just one about uh, if someone wants to get involved with like ground cover, um, you know, in your community and stuff. So we can redirect them to. I'll leave all the links in the description as well. Yeah, well, maybe it's a good it's a good um, to mention also Coretta, our open source project, uh, which is built on eBPF, and and uh, we'd love uh, to get your you know, feedback and help 
building this uh, and, and show the world what EBPF can, can achieve. Yeah, and, and feel free to join our community Slack and we have uh, you know online support there as you try to install our free tier. And I mean, it, it's definitely the best way to experience EBPF. So we welcome feedback from the community and would love to hear what you think. Yeah, and uh, you can find everything on the website. So check out the links in the description below. But yeah, it was really awesome. So many great questions. It's being recorded. So uh, you can watch it later on. And uh, yeah, I had, a, I had a lot of fun. And uh, it was really nice. And uh, it was really great talking to you both. Uh, thanks for joining. And we will do more of these someday. Uh, when things evolve, maybe we can do a part two. A few after a few years, uh, reflect hmm. back on what we discussed today. But yeah, um, cool. Looking forward to it. Uh, really excited. And uh, for everyone else as well, thanks for joining. And uh, yeah, we'll see you in the next one. Bye. Thanks, Kunal. Thanks everyone for yeah, the great. Thank you.